Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney. For the last several weeks, we talked about apprenticeship, the apprenticeable trades, and the kind of education and training that takes place within those trades. As a follow-up to the most recent shows that we did with Dave Barlin at UA51 Plumbers and Pipefitters, we're setting aside this evening's time to talk about apprenticeship and the change within apprenticeship. Over the last 15 years, apprenticeship, which is truly an on-the-job method of learning a skill, has changed significantly. The state requires a minimum of 147 hours of classroom content, plus 2,000 hours a year of an individual working in the field. Well, tonight we brought together three students, three uh, members of the building trades who are both full-time workers and students, who have made a commitment to improving the level of education, improving their level of education. With me this evening, we have Matthew Paquette, John Bacon, and Kevin Kinney. All three are enrolled in construction management programs at the National Labor, Co Labor College in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. And I'm really looking forward to a conversation that sheds some light on the changes within apprenticeship, a changes within the building trades, but probably most significantly, a change in the level of education of the people currently in the building trades and those people coming into the apprenticeable trades. So, John, let's start with you. You've been an iron worker for how many years? 25 years. And in that time, you've made a commitment to take some college courses. Why, why would you even bother doing that? I mean, you're, you, you work full time, you earn a good, you have a, an excellent skill, there's a good income, the union represents you well. Why is it important for somebody to take the initiative to enroll in, in individual programs, individual courses, or to enroll in a bachelor's degree like you? Well, I found, uh, I, I've been, I worked in the field for 10 years. After the 10 years, I, I went in the office. I worked as an estimator, project manager, operations manager. I've had a bunch of titles. Uh, today, in dealing with the construction managers, there's a lot of demands. You have to have uh, some technological background. You, you know, you have to be computer savvy. And a lot of times, I felt inadequate uh, in dealing with the contractors um, because I didn't have the skills to, to really work on their level. So uh, when this, this, this particular program came up, I, I, I really saw the opportunity and wanted to take advantage of it to uh, just to be more on par and, and more successful in my job in dealing with the contractors. So you think the technology has really played a much bigger role in the work that you do as an iron worker? Absolutely. Why? Um, everything everything is, is, is computer based now. They want to know s scheduling and, and uh, they want, you know, BIM software, and there's, there's just a lot of demands that, you know, our company being a small company, we didn't have a lot of um, technological, we've never had technological support. We've never had, a, you know, an IT guy around. And uh, I've learned a lot already in this, just this past year, and it's, and it's been very helpful, you know, in communicating with the contractors. So these courses that you're taking really are pretty broad based. They deal with technology, they deal with effective communication, and how to work with people, the history of labor, I think it's interesting, the Institute over the last number of months has developed a foreman's training program specifically, to, this one's targeted to IBEW 99, and the same things that you're talking about in terms of giving people the professional development, understanding the role of technology, how to work with people in the history of organized labor, all of those things combined are the, within the program offering of foreman's training and more and more individuals are looking at it saying, well, I'd like to become a foreman on the job, what's required for me to be there? So I think that requirement, that need, that desire to become better informed, more technologically advanced, I think it's, it's good for the individual, but it's also good for the company. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. In fact, in line with that, uh, we actually, uh, they're starting a program, it's a pilot program, right? It's gonna kick off in May for superintendents uh, training 
and another gentleman from our company is, is going to be attending that training as well at the National Labor College. It's, it's, uh, it's through the um, impact, in I don't know if you're familiar with impact, mm -hmm. but work is management uh, progressive cooperative trust uh, is, is putting that on with the help of the National Labor College and uh, he, he'll be going to that. It's interesting how organized labor has really made a commitment to educating the people who do the work on the job to guarantee that the quality of work is done to the highest level. Uh, let me move on to you in terms of, Kevin, you've been a bricklayer for how many years? Uh, I've been in the masonry trade for 20 years. But the difference between you and many other people is that you went back to the masonry trade after you got a degree from URI? Yes, sir. Um, in 92, I graduated uh, from URI with a Bachelor of Arts degree. And um, we were having a small recession at that time. I was out looking for work at what related to my college degree. But to put myself through school, I worked in the trades. And while I was having a hard time trying to find work relating to my degree, I still had my former uh, bosses calling me up all the time about going back to work, you know? And eventually I just said, well, I have to work. Um, instead of like pounding the pavement, I went back and started uh, laboring and then I eventually started bricklaying in the masonry trade. It, it's ironic, as you mentioned this, I was a high school teacher for 20 years. Um, and there were always individuals in the class who were very creative. You could almost identify those students that you could say to them in their senior year or their junior year, have you considered a degree in fine arts? And, and I can, in reality, I can almost see a, a clear correlation between people who would do work in the skilled trades. But when I think of bricklaying in particular, um, some of the design work, some of the layout work, some of the pieces that come with bricklaying, there's definitely an art and a craft involved. Oh, I agree, definitely. There's a skill involved too that uh, with bricklaying, a lot of times uh, certain people can have the, the knack and certain people don't. It's just part of the trade and you usually figure that out you know, relatively soon in trying to actually lay the brick or lay the block. I mean, like I said, I labored for I don't know, a good eight, nine years before I had the opportunity to uh, lay the brick and block, but those eight or nine years were well, you know, very educated, educated me towards uh, that goal of becoming the mechanic eventually. Well, I think it's interesting you say that because when we talk about apprenticeship, there's the classroom component. Mm -hmm. And over and above that, there's 2,000 hours of work each year for either a four or a five year period. That eight or 10,000 hours has really provided an opportunity for you as a bricklayer or a John, you as an iron worker to be able to learn the skill from somebody who's done it for a long time. And when we look at apprenticeship from a historical point of view, actually apprenticeship training is the longest, most effective way of training people how to do a job well. And whether you have a degree or an apprenticeship training program, there's always that component of learning from the experts that's so important. Um, okay, the, Matthew, let's move on to you. You're a bricklayer as well, but you don't have the 20 years that the, uh, the people around you have. Right. You're probably the, you're the newbie in the bunch. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the new guy. Okay, so you've been here for six years. You've been a, in the bricklayer, as a bricklayer for six years. Yep, since 06. And your background is, a, I think, a little bit different um, than the other two gentlemen. You come with a background from a completely different place. Right. Um, most of my background is military. Uh, I served 18 years in Navy as an electrician. Um, in 06, after coming back from my last deployment, I decided to make a couple of uh, career changes. And one of them was, um, uh, at the time, I, I was management in, in retail. And I had some screwy hours, so you know, I, I worked it out. Me and my wife talked about it, and we wanted something a little bit more stable. And I looked into the building trades. Um, a lot of people say, why'd you go into bricklaying instead of electrical, since that was your background? But uh, I wanted to try something different. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I like using my hands, I like being involved. And, uh, you know, the bricklayers you know, it seemed to be the thing, you know, they, they were hiring at the time, so I, I took a chance. Um, you know, I've enjoyed the, the, the trade and uh, enjoyed the training. Uh, it's a challenge, and uh, I love a challenge. Um, well, I think it's interesting that um, when the Institute for Labor Studies and Research, through our partnership with the National Labor College, when we agreed that we would work in and, and seek out individuals who were both qualified and motivated to get enrolled in a degree program in construction management. 
for the first class, there was a definite requirement that people had to have 30 college credits. And sometimes it was a combination of college credits, and sometimes you already had a bachelor's degree, and sometimes people already had an associate's degree. And, and it's interesting because the thing that we're finding at the Institute when we talk to all of the technical building trades, that it's not the same people going into the trades now that it was 30 years ago. Traditionally, it appeared that if your, your, your father or an uncle or an aunt, for that matter, were in the trades prior to that, then you kind of had a pathway in. Whereas now, the process to get into apprenticeship, apprenticeship training is significantly different. I know at UA51, for example, you know, students make an application. Many of them don't pass the math test. They go before an interview with a panel of individuals who vote. And it's really based upon, are you the right person to get into apprenticeship? And oftentimes, our information is saying that there can be as many as 1,000 applications for 35 positions in an apprenticeship in a year. Have you noticed a difference within the trades of the people coming into the trades, how many of them have college courses or how many have degrees when they come in? Any one of you? There's been, there's, uh, in a, when I went through my apprenticeship, I, I would say that at least half the class, half the group of people that uh, I was an apprentice with had some kind of college or actually were still in college. Uh, you know, they were going through their apprenticeship with classes still, you know, just maybe one, two classes, but they were continuing their education. Um, so, and uh, I guess that answers your question, right? As far as like... No, it's true. Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, it's interesting that you would say that. So within the bricklayers, both of you would agree that even now there's that significant change. It's not a matter if you were the son of a bricklayer, so you're automatically going to get in. You know, Kevin, what do you think? <clears throat> well, I like following up on what Matt said. It seems like the um, the older generation is still, you know, I guess you could call it old school. They they got in through family members, or they um, they had the opportunity to work themselves up through the trade, through the, uh, the non-union sector, and then they got into the union sector. Um, I see nowadays with the apprentices that followed me, like Matt was saying, there's um, far more uh, an appreciation for education. And uh, it seems that a lot of the younger uh, apprentices now do have some sort of background with getting a, a higher education, some maybe at CCRI and taking classes or like we're doing, taking some online classes. So um, it, 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 there is an appreciable difference between the old generation and the generation of today. Well, one of the methods that we tried to design with the three of you in particular uh, when this program was launched nationally, we said, if we bring people together every Friday night, provide a facilitator, you guys can actually do the work online at home and then come as a group together on a Friday night, ask the questions, have a facilitator there. And, and so it's much more of a hybrid approach. It's not solely online. You build a cohort. And it's interesting because I know personally that you guys have been working together now for two years and that working together or learning from each other as a cohort. Tell me about the courses. How about we pick each of you and you can each talk about one of the courses that you had. Prior to this evening's show, we talked about, you know, the content of some of the courses. John, tell me, pick one course. Tell me about any one of the courses that you took. Uh, we, we took one course, I, forgive me, I, the, the name of the, uh, that particular class is escaping me, but we had to uh, build a bridge uh, on uh, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, program, build, bridge building program. And I, I personally struggled with it. It was a technology thing where I, I was, you know, we, we, uh, we were given an assignment, we needed to build this bridge, you know, uh, a certain style of bridge. And I just, I couldn't get past, you know, opening up the program. So you were actually building the bridge online. It wasn't like you had popsicle sticks on a no, table building this thing. Right, it was, a, it was like, a, like a CAD drawing. A, a, Com computer-generated engineering of a bridge. So what are the, some of the factors that you have to take in? When you're designing something like that, and you know, as, as an iron worker, you understand how things fit together. Right. What were some of the components of that online program that made it a little more difficult? Just being able to navigate through the program. I didn't know, I didn't know where to begin to, to, uh, to start uh, installing the different components. 
And if it, was, if it weren't for these two guys, I, would have, I wouldn't have been able to complete the project. So having that cohort was very helpful for me. Once, once you know, we got together and they helped me get started, I was able to complete the bridge and I understood structurally how it worked. But just getting through the technology, I, I found very difficult without, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without help. And I think it's really important that, that we, we discuss that piece because it's not just a matter of learning about the skill that you, we know that you have. It's not just about being an iron worker. It's being able to adapt and use the technology. And I think that's one of the things that's making the trades so different now. You know, when we talk about being able to interact, sometimes even three-dimensionally with some of the things on the screen, you know, it, it really brings to light the fact that there's many classroom components that we will be able to make much more alive and real in those kind of situations. Um, Kevin, when we take a look at any of the courses, what one stands out in your mind? Um, I believe the one we're taking right now has been um, very eye-opening for me because um, it's uh, right now we're taking an estimating course and it brings into play a lot of factors that I normally don't get to see being a mechanic, you know, going to the job site every day and laying the brick and block where you find out um, like we're doing unit pricing and square footage pricing and, and where do these prices come from, what databases to use, um, basically what the professionals at the office have to deal with every day to bring about a bid and try to, you know, get the project so someone like me has the work to go to. So I find it extremely interesting the way, um, you know, the bid process itself and um, the amount of time and uh, effort that's put into making a bid and getting the, the correct figures so your bid is not too high and too low. And um, uh, like I said, it, for me, I think it just opens my eyes up to my trade even more that I, I didn't really understand for the most part by just you know, working on the job site. Well, I think it makes it much broader. Yeah, exactly. It, in terms of the job, I think you can see the job from the big picture now and you understand even issues of man hours and how it's allocated. Mm -hmm. And if you get a period when the job is down and you're paying people and the job is not getting done, the costs continue to roll but the project doesn't get funded. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in many ways it, it enables you to be a better worker, a more qualified worker, but would it be fair to say that it gives you the skills at one point to say, I know that I could start my own company? Oh, I definitely. Um... I would say that, you know, once we, you know, go through the, the, the course itself and we, uh, we finish up and have a degree, I mean, I, I believe this program allows you to make a step in that direction if you would like to, or make a step in another direction, still staying in the construction field, but mm -hmm. going to the professional level, maybe working a, a, with an estimating team or being a superintendent or um, you know, uh, a project manager. There's, there's a lot of opportunities that this degree you know, uh, would let you have, and, and the avenues are, you know, are, are many because um, I, I find it's, you know, the, this degree is broad enough that it gives you um, sectors of the industry that like, I never even knew existed that now are opened up that if I want to get out of the mechanical side of, of working, I, you know, instead of using my hands all the time, I can actually you know, go to the professional side and you know, use my brain and my experience from all the years I have as working on the job site. Well, it's interesting you say that because many, in many of the building trades, the comment that I hear is that you know, whether you're being an iron worker or laying br bricks and blocks, Sometime around age 50, you say, I don't know if I can, how much more I can do. This cold weather is killing my knees. And so I think it almost provides a transitional opportunity for you to take those mechanical skills that you've learned and transfer them over because you know you're a good mechanical tradesman. Mm -hmm. And now you know, how does a company work? How do estimates work? Even the issue of reading blueprints and understanding how important they are. Um, let me move on and say, of all the courses that you've taken, which ones, Matt, stand out, or which one stands out? All the classes that, that uh, John and Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not going to discuss them because they've already did. Uh, I like history. I, I've always had a knack for history. And like I said before, I was, I'm fairly new to like, the whole union uh, concept, you know, mm -hmm. just affiliated in 06. 
Uh, we took a class with uh, one of our instructors. I can't think, think of the name of the class right now, but the instructor was uh, Ruth Ruttenberg. And it was uh, more of a history class. And it, the, the idea of the, the class was basically, you know, why we have unions, where they came from, why they were established. Uh, talked about all the, the hardship that uh, workers had to go through at the turn of the century, you know, the creation of the AFL-CIO. Uh, um, and, you know, all the way from, from the early 19th century to present day. Um, and that was really enlightening to me, you know, just to, to understand why we, why, you know, things occurred, what happened, you know, and what brought us to, you know, where we are today. Um, and that really, you know, I found that extremely interesting, you know. I, I think that whole history of the, the trades, the whole history of organized labor is critical for everyone to understand. Because it, it, the, the, history, the history of organized labor really, truly are, for lack of a better word, the building blocks of what made us what we are. And, and we all know that organized labor is undergoing attacks on a regular basis now. Um, and we know that organized labor was really responsible for creating this middle class. And the fear now is that this middle class is slowly being eaten away, creating, creating a, a greater divide. Um, I think it would be really interesting to get your perspective as people who work in the field on this whole attack on organized labor from the perspective of people who have invested a lot of time, a lot of money in ensuring that you can provide high quality, high level of technical input and skills in a job. Because what I'm hearing is, well, anybody can lay brick, anybody can lay iron. Is that a fair statement? I mean, do you really need all this education and training? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Why do you say that? Um, I believe because uh, I, you just can't hand somebody a trowel and, and, a, and a level and say, you know, go build a pier. I mean, it's not, you know, it, what's going to happen? What's, how's it going to look? What's it going to, how's it going to come out? And it, it, it just, it takes so long. It, it took me so many years just, you know, being on hand, being there and watching these gentlemen work. All, all my, uh, you know, I guess not even my peers, my, my elders when I was younger, watching the elder statesmen, journeymen, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. working. And it took such a long time. And then when I got into union, I, I went to the apprentice program. And that, that, was, um, that was so beneficial. I, I, it's hard to explain it because, it, you know, you're getting, you're getting the, um, the experience from the professionals and the, the people who've had the experience over many years. And they're telling you the right things to do, and you know, don't don't get, you know, don't take the shortcuts. Learn the correct way. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because in the long run, your product is not as good. So it's like it takes all those years of experience to be passed on to the next generation, and it's our responsibility to pass it on to the next generation to keep our trades flourishing and keep them profitable and you know keep us working. And I think that's what you're doing now. You, each of you and many, many other people within the trades have truly made a commitment to say, I can learn everything that was given to me, all of the skills that have been learned over hundreds of years within the trade, but you're now taking that step. And you, you know, when we talk about it in particular, John, your, your reference to technology and the implementation of technology that didn't even exist 10 years ago into the building trades. We did a, 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 a guesstimate on how much money in Rhode Island the unions put into education, training, in every way. And whether it's individuals who pay out of their pockets for education, whether it's the vast amount of monies that organized labor puts into apprenticeship training, or professional developments that teacher unions and teachers put into professional development. And we're seeing that well over $18 million a year go into training and education of people within unions and union organizations. And that, I think that really talks about the commitment to professionalism and the commitment to ensuring that the quality of services that organized labor provides will continue to grow. We did say at the very beginning of the program that apprenticeship training is not your grandfather's Buick anymore. It looks different. The students coming in are different. Where do you see it going in the future as an iron worker? Where do you see it changing? What, what's technology doing? Um, and, and just before I 
and give you the chance to answer. When I watched I-95 go up, I was absolutely amazed that they could build this piece of iron and cement at a location hundreds of miles away, and people could put it together like Lego blocks, and that bolt, two inches thick, would fit the hole two inches wide. How does that work? Did, it, did that technology and computers help? Oh, absolutely. They, they draw out, they, they can run a beam now just on the technology. They, they have these beam lines where they could take a beam and run it through, you know, it's all computer generated, where, where the holes are gonna be, where the copes are gonna be. It goes through the machine and then they, they can send it back and send it through again and they don't miss those holes. They, they don't elongate the hole. They can have the machine drill three times and it will hit the same hole every time and it will not be elongated or misshaped or, uh, you know, back, in, back when people used to draw that stuff by hand and have to lay it all out by hand, you know, things weren't always so perfect. So, um, and, and a lot of that technology, you know, we're, we're, we're needing to incorporate that into technology at, at our level too, at, at the subcontractor level, to coordinate with, those, with the technologies coming through from the fabrication plants. And so, yeah, you know, go, getting, getting the education is, is, is very important going forward. The integration that you talked about I think is really important because when you talk about you, the, the job that you do depends upon the people in the facilities who drill out and do the coping on those pieces of metal. It made me think of when you were making your comment about laying brick and if you're doing a brick facade on a building that's 30 stories high, how important the correlation is between the work that you did in laying the iron before you even get there. So I think it's interesting that we can have a construction management course with a variety of people from the different building trades, and to go back to your comment, John, you depend on each other to get through the course, but you also depend upon each other to have a finished product. The, if you had to give advice um, to young students in high school now, to tell them about whether or not they should even consider construction trades, um, because in many cases, my experience as a high school teacher was that Many of the counselors spent a lot of time getting students ready to go to college. The example here is you can have a trade, you can complete the trade. While you're taking the trade, you can get a college degree. Before you go to, the, to, to uh, enter the trade, you can have a college degree. You can integrate military training, college degrees, and skilled trades. On that topic, about giving advice to parents who ultimately help make the decision, to guidance counselors and to students. What, would you, what advice would you give to students, each of you individually, about whether or not to consider an apprenticeable trade as an option in terms of an income, working conditions, raising a family, all those things that come with the results of earning an income in a building trade? I would, I, today, I would definitely recommend going, getting into the building trades when I, when I was a kid, even though I did it, it was kind of, it was almost like uh, people thought less of you, kind of, if you, work, if you worked in the trades. But today, I, 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 don't, I think that attitude's changed a bit. People in the trades are now making more money than people coming out of college a lot of times, or have a much better shot of getting a job than somebody who, who may have just come out of college and, 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 and has a lot of debt, you know, and student loans from going to college. So I think, you know, if, if you can do both, really, that's get involved in the trades, make a great living, and, and also, you know, always try to further your education. You can always further your education. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, your perspective? To follow up on what he was saying about um, furthering your education, if I had to tell, if I had to sit down and talk to apprentices in the bricklaying trade, I would say, uh, try to cover all your bases. Besides being a good mechanic, you know, try to get the skills to be a good foreman. Try to get the skills to be a good professional, meaning like try to learn the ins and outs of the trade so you have, uh, you have different strengths and weaknesses. You can find where you're better at this than you're better at that, you know. They say you're a better mechanic than a better estimator or, you know, or you're, you're better at um, you know, coordinating, so it's like a foreman skill than you actually are being a mechanic. So there's always different areas to land in our trade, but mm -hmm. if you, you don't have that opportunity, unless you have the education and the wherewithal to Excellent take the point. time 
to learn all those different opportunities in one particular trade. And the great thing about something like that is that every trade has this. Yeah. You know, it's not just bricklaying. I mean, obviously, iron workers have it, electrical workers have it, you know, pipe fitters have it. So there's a lot of different avenues you could fall into uh, in those particular trades just if you get the education. It's an excellent perspective about moving around within the trade. Mm -hmm. The final word on, it, on advising students, counselors, and parents, it's all left up to you. you <laughs> say, Matt? Um, well, pretty much, it, you know, it's about, about the same as Kevin and John. Um, I would treat, it would be a case-by-case -case situation. I couldn't give the same, you know, advice to everyone. Um, but if someone was interested in going into the building trades like I did, you know, later in life, um, I would definitely, you know, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, say yes, go for yeah. it. But never stop learning, okay? While you're learning a trade, while you're learning a new skill set, okay, also look to continue your education, okay? Even, even though you're learning a skill. Um, in the military, it was some, you know, something that they, they've, they always taught us was that you always teach the person under you to take your job so that you can learn the next step. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a bricklayer. There's still a lot to learn as a journeyman, but I'm also looking towards the next step. I want to, you know, take the next step in education and earning a, a bachelor's degree in construction management is an excellent step, um, which is why I, you know, joined the program. So for anyone coming into the building trades, uh, regardless of what field you go into, electrician, plumbing, um, being a bricklayer like ourselves and stuff, that's excellent, excellent skill set, but don't stop there. You know, continue the education. Look for the next step. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much. Um, I have to say from my perspective of as executive director at the Institute, I'm very proud of the work that you did. I'm very proud that the Institute could be a part of helping to make a difference in your lives, but I think you make a difference in the lives of a lot of journeymen, not just your family, but the journeymen that you work with, the, the, the apprentices that see you on a daily basis. I truly want to say thank you for your commitment to improving the trades. I want to congratulate you for your commitment to um, going well out of your way after working all week and taking classes during the week and coming together on a Friday night that most people wouldn't ever consider doing. And, and I truly want to congratulate you and thank you in, in, in many, many ways. Thank you for attending the show. I'm hoping that um, many students get a chance to hear your stories as we go along because I think you could be the very beginning of changing the mindset of the building trades, how important they make, what they bring economically to this country, but most importantly understanding it is not your grandfather's Buick anymore. These are highly technical skilled trades that require college and technical level courses, 10,000 hours of work, and I'm not quite sure even some attorneys spend that much time doing jobs like that. So gentlemen, thank you for coming. I appreciate you taking the time, and I look forward to um, you coming on this stage after you graduate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. As we mentioned, uh, we looked at an uh, indentured uh, uh, document from uh, the town of Johnston in 1786. But later on, uh, within 10 or 15 years, uh, indentures would become very legalized. And uh, the one you're going to see on your screen momentarily uh, is from New York in 1799. And the person who's being indentured out is going to learn the trade, art, and mystery. Oh, I love the use of that word, huh? Mystery of being a shoemaker. And you have to understand, back in the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, making shoes was a very, very important thing. Today, it's also automated. Uh, we forget that it was a, uh, uh, a craftsman uh, who did it. But this reads more like a contract because it says what the apprentice can and cannot do. And let me just read a couple of sentences from it. He shall not absent himself day or night from his said master's service without his leave, without his permission, more or less, nor haunt, I love that word, nor haunt alehouses, taverns, or playhouses, but in all things behave himself as a faithful apprentice ought to do. And uh, 
I'm sure there's some people out there writing management rights clauses right now who said, you know, maybe we could take some of that language and work it in uh, very nicely uh, even today. But a lot of these things, uh, the wording changes slightly, but it still means the same thing. Another document you'll uh, be looking at, uh, and this is a sad case, at least in Rhode Island history and, and, and many of the other uh, colonies as well. Um, this is kind of a form that you would get around income tax time today, uh, in early April. Um, and in this case, it was from Warwick uh, in the late 1700s, and a farmer owned a slave, and just like today, when you own a car, a house, or other property, you have to pay a tax on it. And in this case, the farmer had to pay extra because he owned another human being. A very difficult thing uh, to uh, embrace uh, at all. And so we lived in a society back then when obviously not everyone was equal. And uh, this particular document uh, certainly shows it. This is a sheriff's warrant from 1811 in Rhode Island. And when they picked you up or delivered the warrant, they had to underline one of four areas that you belonged to. You were a yeoman farmer, a laborer, a trader, or T-R-A-D-E-R, -E someone who worked in commerce, or you were a gentleman. Well, I wonder how many times they underlined the gentleman. I don't think they made too many of those uh, calls uh, even uh, back then. Um, and interestingly, this is an early pay slip from Pennsylvania in the 1790s. And you look at one side, and the guy was paid uh, 22 shillings for almost several weeks of work. But on the other side, you'll notice he had to sign the document, and his signed with an X. He couldn't write his own name, and we'll find that a lot of our ancestors found themselves uh, in that same boat. So uh, by the time we get to uh, the end of the 18th century, we're going to see an incredible change uh, in the world of work and, and the way we do things. And we're going to see the emergence uh, of a labor movement. Uh, although still primitive, uh, it's readily identifiable uh, as much as a union would be uh, today. So the 1790s, in many ways, are the turning point uh, from an agricultural America, even though it'll take another century to fully uh, get away from that, and industry will take over. But by 1790, we discover that industrialization, the first factory in America is built on the banks of the Blackstone River. It's known as Slater's Mill. It's still there, a wonderful place to bring your children. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this initial foray into the early history of the labor movement, and uh, I hope you stay tuned uh, for our future uh, installments, and we'll be taking a look at Slater's Mill and what happens there uh, way back in 1790. Thank you. Good. Good. Let me stretch for a minute. All right. Take two. Take two. <laughs> You know, and Rod, the funny thing, I got to go do a three hour. Good evening, and welcome to the uh, second installment of the history of uh, American workers and their labor unions. Uh, although we'll be looking at the United States uh, uh, in its totality, uh, at the same time, we're going to try to keep uh, your interest alive by looking at what happened to Rhode Island at a corresponding time. Uh, again, uh, I teach this at URI, and uh, it goes on for uh, 14 weeks, and so you're only going to get a, uh, a much shortened version, but we hope you take enough interest in this to maybe pick up a book and, and learn a little more about uh, the history of working people uh, and their unions. Uh, last time I, I ended up by talking about indentured servants, uh, people who uh, uh, signed a contract, usually at a young age, to go and learn a skill. Uh, from a, a master worker uh, so that they would not become burdens on the town or the state where they lived and would actually get a skill and be able to support themselves and their family once they grew up. 
But something else happened, and it happened right here in Rhode Island, which makes it all the more amazing. Uh, we're always used to uh, reading or hearing in the media how we're 45th or 46th and this, that, or the other thing. Well, here's something historically we were number one in. Back in 1790, a long time ago, in 1790, an English immigrant named Samuel Slater, uh, who had worked uh, in textiles uh, in merry old England back in the 1780s, uh, decided to emigrate to the United States, because we'd already won the war under the American Revolution by then. And he came to Rhode Island because he heard about a man named Moses Brown. Now, some of you may recognize that name because there's a prep school uh, on the east side of Providence named after Moses Brown. Moses Brown was part of the very, very influential Brown family. And in fact, his uh, brother John Brown uh, was perhaps the most famous of them all, and sometimes for the wrong reasons. He was a slave trader. He continued to trade in that awful traffic uh, even after the American Revolution, while his brother Moses Brown left it behind and he went into a whole new endeavor, and that was the up-and-coming factory system, which he knew about from England. So Moses Brown, today we'd call him a venture capitalist, he raised the money, the capital, and he bankrolled Sam Slater, who had the skill and who had memorized how to operate a factory, how to build machinery, and how to fix it. This was a skill that virtually no one else in America had at that time. And if the British had caught him uh, bringing out such sensitive material, uh, they would have locked him up. Uh, this would have been a 007 uh, type of an affair. But uh, Slater was a smart cookie. And what he did was memorize, put into his head. He never wrote it down, no blueprints, because he would have been arrested for industrial espionage, uh, even though that's using the terminology uh, of today. So he finally got together with Moses Brown, and on the banks of the Blackstone River in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, in 1790, not only did Rhode Island have its first factory, but the United States of America had its first factory as well. And you look up any business history book, go to the index, look in the back, check for Pawtucket or Slater's Mill, and you'll see that we were number one. And we rode that wave of novelty right through the 19th century and into the 20th with a tremendous amount of good fortune uh, because Rhode Island became a very wealthy state. Uh, because of our early experimentation with the factory system. Now, today you might think that anyone who came up with such a, uh, a wonderful idea, uh, something that was going to be a game changer uh, in the economy that would overturn the old ways of doing things, uh, would be welcomed with open arms. Uh, if you stopped into Pawtucket today and spoke with the mayor and said you were going to bring 500 new jobs and uh, you were going to get off the exit at Route 95 and go right to City Hall in Pawtucket, uh, they couldn't stop hugging you and would want to know what they could do to assist you. Back in those days, however, we have to remember that the factory was an alien introduction to the town of Pawtucket, which was still agriculturally oriented. And when they got done, Slater's Mill was the tallest building in Pawtucket. It was taller than the local church that had a steeple. So the factory would become the symbol in many ways of this new way of life. And other things happened as well, things which did not endear the factory owners, Moses Brown and Sam Slater, uh, to the local population. They did certain things in order to make the factory operate, which irritated uh, many of the locals. For example, they used a water wheel. That's why they were on the Blackstone River. The water wheel would go around. It would have a big belt that would go from the water wheel into the factory, turn another spindle with a smaller belt on it, and eventually go to somebody's uh, machine 
or a tool, uh, almost like we'd uh, use an electric or a power tool today, only this time it was water and it didn't cost anything. That's how they began the factory system. But in order to make a facility that would run year round, they needed to create a reservoir of water because we all know in the summer in Rhode Island, uh, there's a good chance we're gonna have a drought and there won't be any water there to run that water wheel. And of course, today we know that we'll be out sneaking out about midnight uh, to water our back lawn and make sure the authorities don't catch us uh, because we're not supposed to be doing that. So Slater and Moses Brown flooded a large area of public arable land where the townspeople used to bring their goats and their, their cattle and other uh, livestock in order to get a free feed. And one day they went there and it was covered by a new lake that they were going to use for a reservoir uh, in tough climactic uh, times. In order also to give the water wheel even more power, Slater and Moses Brown then built a dam which would create even more falling water to get that water wheel to really go at one heck of a speed. But by doing this, they irritated the townspeople because the fish that used to live in the Blackstone would eventually leave, go out into Narragansett Bay, they could live in salt water or fresh water, swim around the world once or twice, and then come back in order to um, lay their eggs in the Blackstone. Now, how they did that and uh, the radar they used uh, for that, the fish were really something. But when they came back after 1790, they could no longer get to the Blackstone because the dam was so high, they couldn't get over it. We've all seen those pictures of salmon uh, out west uh, jumping up uh, huge falls. Well, these fish didn't quite have the ability. And of course, the idea of a fish ladder, which we use today uh, to make it easy for fish to get back to where they came from, uh, wasn't on the horizon uh, for well over another 100 years. So people were incensed that they lost a free access to what we know today was very nutritional food and the fact that it was free. So there were a lot of different things that would irritate uh, the townspeople in Pawtucket, despite the fact uh, that the factory gave employment to many people. But the fact that they hired a lot of people also caused certain irritations because Slater and Brown almost unanimously hired young children and teenage girls to do the work for them. When I say children, I'm talking about kids five, six, and seven years old. And you might say to yourself, why would anybody in 1790, or in 1990 for that matter, use children so little? Because they didn't have the mental capacity, obviously, to be good workers. But because the machines were so tight, they were low to the ground, they used these kids because of their small size. A spool or a bobbin might come off one of the machines, a thread might break, the yarn would snap, and these kids were used to crawl under the machine or between them in order to replace the spool or to rethread the machine itself and then try to get out of there without any injury. And believe me, many of them were injured over the years. And the other group were the teenage girls. Uh, they had learned the weaving trade at home, usually under their mother's guidance. And so they were naturals uh, to work in the textile factory, and that's the first factory uh, here in Rhode Island that did textiles. And so they were work, but they were very young as well, although Work on the farm, of course, was not easy uh, either. So you had almost all children uh, working uh, at Slater's Mill. This was called the Rhode Island system. And when the factory system spread to other states, other places tried to avoid it. And we know of one incident in the 1830s where they used corporal punishment against these children when they got out of line. They hanged the kid by his feet from one of the rafters and beat him with a stick. This is someone in one of the superintendents. 
And they beat him so bad that he died. The superintendent left town, and justice was never meted out to that child. And these kids had to work long hours, as I've mentioned earlier, because of the uh, uh, having to look at the sun uh, in the summer and the uh, much shorter days in the winter. But it was not an easy job. It was uncomfortable. The hours seemed interminable. Uh, they were treated with very little respect. And I think the first thing that people would say was, why did the parents allow them to work in a situation like that? And the answer was very easy. In this era, 1790 and succeeding years, America, by and large, had very little cash. Almost everything was traded or bartered. If you wanted food, if you wanted clothing, if you wanted one thing or another, you usually went to the village store and put in your wagon whatever you had to trade. Moses Brown and Sam Slater were true revolutionaries in that they introduced hard cash to the factory system. And so they paid these little kids maybe a silver dollar a week or every couple of weeks, and they brought that money home to their parents who never saw cash. And therefore, they were willing to put up with these often intolerable conditions that the kids had to uh, toil uh, under. It was the money nexus, the equation. This would be the beginning of capitalism like we'd never seen before. But it would also be the beginning of a fight back where working people, regardless of their age, were no longer going to take conditions as they were or get pushed around the way that they had been. And so in 1824, due to a global recession, if you can believe it, we had globalization even way back then, England was flooding the world market with textiles. So much so that they felt the competition right there in Pawtucket. And because of that, management was forced to do what it always does, lengthen the hours, cut the salaries, and cut back on lunch and supper. This was unbearable to the people who worked there. And we know that if not the first strike by women in America, the 1824 turnout, and that's what they called it, it was a walkout, a turnout, a strike, the young female weavers took it upon themselves not to tolerate these conditions and went out on strike and had the full support of the community behind them because of the other things that Slater and Moses Brown had done to irritate everyone in the area. Now, we don't have a lot of uh, information about what happened uh, during that strike, uh, later on, I'll, uh, well, you'll see in just a moment, uh, a page from a diary that was kept in 1824. Uh, it was recently uh, uh, acquired by the Rhode Island Historical Society about 10 years ago. And somebody writes an account of the riotous nature of this first strike, uh, in Rhode Island anyway, uh, led by women. And Moses Brown and Sam Slater were treated with uh, uh, great disrespect uh, by these young strikers. Uh, people threw stones at them, called them names. Uh, somebody tried to torch uh, Slater's mill. And after several days, both sides, in 1824, sat down at the bargaining table, although again, we don't know any details really about it, and they were able to beat back some of the concessions. I think they got back their full lunch break. Their pay wasn't cut as severely, and they didn't have to work any longer uh, hours because it was almost impossible for them to work longer hours anyway without light. But it's interesting, 1824, and most people think the labor movement didn't come around until the 20th century. Already people were standing up for their rights, trying to do what was right. And uh, these young women, and joined by some of the, the boys in the strike as well, uh, took it upon themselves to make labor history. And here you can see a uh, 
picture of Sam Slater. Interestingly, we don't have a picture of Roger Williams uh, portrait or anything. We don't know what he looked like. But Sam Slater, the founder of the factory system, uh, we do know exactly uh, what he looked like and not a bad looking fellow. But uh, that's the history of that early uh, mill, um, the riot that accompanied it. And after the strike in 1828, the people of Pawtucket got together and chipped in $500 and put a public clock in the church steeple so that everyone would have access to time. Prior to that, all they did was ring bells morning, noon, and night, uh, waking the whole town whether you had to go to work or not. And um, management held control of that time. After the strike, workers at least had access to what the time was. It was really a great victory, but it simply would change the playing field uh, once again uh, in the other areas where management and labor would go after each other. But we can't underestimate the fact that in 1824, people uh, already uh, were fighting back. And Slater and Brown had so much trouble trying to institute uh, industrial discipline to make people come to work on time, to uh, show up six days a week. Uh, oftentimes when the berries or uh, other uh, crops were ripe, the people didn't go to work. They went and did what they had done for time immemorial, and that is to go out and go back to the farm, at least for a day or so, uh, until that work uh, got done. And so Slater's Mill in 18, 1790, and then of course what happened in 1824 with the uh, walkout, uh, really uh, marked a turning point, uh, not only in Rhode Island economic history, but also in American economic history, because the factory would be here to stay, and slowly but surely, agriculture would not necessarily fade away, but over a 100-year period, it definitely took second place to industrialization. And Rhode Island went on to become the most urbanized, industrialized state in the nation. And what I mean by that, more capital was invested in factories than in any other state. More people toiled in the mills and lived in urban areas as a percentage of our population than anywhere else in the new country. And interestingly, uh, Moses Brown, and uh, if you ever really want to look at this, there are all kinds of books written about it. Uh, the Rhode Island Historical Society Library has just about every piece of paper that ever came out of Slater's Mill, so it's all there for you to look at. It's uh, fascinating as can be. And by the way, here's a, uh, a dollar bill. And in those days, different cities and banks would put out their own uh, uh, funds. And in this case, this one's from East Greenwich. And if you look at the portrait on it, it's two women working at a loom. Amazing, East Greenwich, uh, way back there in the early uh, 1800s. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week, Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m.